to, um, to, to be confirmed on the schedule for tomorrow, but I think there is not going to be anything. So if anyone has any suggestion that they want to do, the Zoom room will be open. So I'd be happy to, to turn up and have informal discussions. Or we can have some kind of open problems again or something if people want to. But if there isn't interest, and, and by interest, I mean someone saying in the chat to me during the talks today, say, or emailing me, then we won't have anything formally tomorrow. But if two or three of you want to use the Zoom room to, to have a research discussion, feel free. And as I say, feel free to contact me if you do think of something that would be useful to do if you want to have some kind of discussion of the, the lecture courses. I, I, I doubt on short notice we can get all the lecturers to turn up, but maybe one or two of them might be willing to. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to, to talk with anyone who can come tomorrow if they want to. Um, so with that said, um, let me introduce Caroline Uhler to give the third lecture in her series of, of talks on graphical models. Caroline. Thank you very much, Tommy. Yeah, okay, so we're back to the third lecture. Um, so the first lecture was introducing what graphical models are, this nice marriage between uh, graph theory and probabilistic models. Um, then in the second lecture, we mainly talked about these undirected um, graphical models. So where we have distributions on undirected graphs and we talked about how to learn these undirected graphs. Um, so there we talked about this maximum likelihood approach. That's just an optimization problem where you usually use an L1 penalty to you know, make the parameters sparse and the parameters are the edge weights. So if you make them sparse, that means you get a sparse graph out of it. Um, and then we discussed how you know, some of these algorithms are actually quite problematic in terms of um, they just add this L1 penalty. And so you first have to choose, you have to tune this parameter. Um, that's already a problem. And then, you know, if you, you would think that if you just increase the parameter, the graph becomes sparser and sparser, but that's unfortunately not the case. Well, while the tendency is for the graph to become sparser and sparser, some edges can appear and disappear. And so we discussed a particular um, geometric constraint that is often useful for um, applications, which is this positivity constraint, which is actually a negativity constraint on the parameters um, on the inverse covariance matrix because um, the parameters correspond to the negative of the partial correlation. So if you want positive um, dependence, so there's actually a negativity constraint, so a negative orthogonal constraint on the parameters. And that can actually lead to all these nice uh, statistical properties in terms of learning the graph, but it also has many um, different nice applications. As we saw one, for example, in finance, this um, constraint is actually quite a natural constraint and may give you very good um, estimates of uh, the covariance matrix between different stocks. So that was all in the undirected setting. Um, so today we'll talk about the directed setting. And so again, we'll talk about the problem of learning the graph. Um, and uh, so the directed setting that's used for, uh, to represent causal relationships. And so if we want to learn from data, the underlying causal relationships, that's the problem that we're considering today. And we'll see, you know, here you'll see a lot of nice geometry come up and nice um, combinatorics, in fact, um, come up. Okay, so let's get started. So we had already introduced um, directed graphical models, right? We saw what it means for a directed graphical model to factorize according to a directed graph, right? Where we have every node, so the distribution, the density function can be written as a product where you just have conditionals and every node, every factor only depends on a node and its parents. And so, in fact, if I will write out what a uh, directed graphical model is, um, it's just what it, we just said, right? The distribution has to factor so that it's just factors of a node and its parents. So that means that, you know, if I give you a directed graph, every node is just a function of its parents, of its direct parents, right? Because it has to factor so that you only have these terms here where you have a node and its direct parents. So in this case here, x3 is just some function of some noise, right? It has no parents. Um, then x1 only has the parent x3. So it has to be a function of just x3 and some noise. Um, x2 only has x1 as a parent. So it has to be a function of x1. And then x4 has both parents, x2 and x3. So it is, has, is a function of x2, x3 and some noise. 
So this is um, if you write out what it means to factorize according to a directed acyclic graph, um, what we had seen in the first lecture, then this is exactly what you get out. So these models are actually quite intuitive, right? Um, if you write out the DAG, if you think about causal relationships or heredity, uh, hereditary relationships, which is in fact what Sewell Wright was thinking about when he introduced these models, as we had discussed, and you know, this is a very, very intuitive model, right? Every node is just a function of its parents and some noise. Okay, now, um, something that I find very exciting, um, what is happening now in actually a few areas, but in particular in biology, is that you have more and more interventional data. So, you know, this here gives rise to a distribution, right? And that's somehow the observational distribution. But nowadays, in particular, for example, in biology, you can actually go in and, you know, take, say, these are now genes, okay? So X1, X2, X3, X4, so we have 20,000 genes in a human. So these are genes, and in every cell, you can actually measure the expression of each one of your genes, okay? So that's an observational vector. That's a 20,000-dimensional vector that you get out. And you can get many cells, so say 100,000 cells. So that's uh, your matrix of observations is 20,000 variables, which are the nodes in the graph, times say 100,000 samples. Okay, and so now from this data, we would like to learn this graph. So now it's a graph, a directed graph, a directed acyclic graph on 20,000 nodes. Um, now what is really exciting uh, for causality, I think, is that more and more there is actually interventional data available. So what is interventional data? So how you think of it, if you know, you know about the CRISPR system, well, there what you go in, you go in and you actually delete the gene, right? So you set the expression of a particular gene to zero. Um, so that can be represented, and this is, uh, was introduced by Judy Pearl, um, this kind of uh, thinking of, of interventions um, as this do operation. So this is how it will be re re represented. So do x2 equal to c means instead of having this here, I'm going to set x2 to be equal to c. So I don't have equalities here because this is actually really setting x2 equal to c. Okay, so that would be the intervention. I go in and I take x2 and I just set it equal to zero. Like the constant could, for example, be zero in a knockout experiment because I'm just going to delete that gene and making it dysfunctional. Um, so then you can ask yourself what happens, right? So if I set x2 to be equal to c, well, x3 is not going to change at all, right? But x4 is going to change because I actually changed x2, right? And x1 is only a function of x3, which didn't change. So x1 is also not going to change at all. OK, so you see that with these do operations, you just have changes downstream of you. OK, so I went in and I changed x2. OK, I did an intervention. These are usually described like this. So I did an intervention on x2. And then only things downstream of me are going to change, OK, not upstream of me. And I see there is a question. Or in practice, see the only possible constant, or are there physically meaningful ways to set the gene to some non-zero constant C? Yes, so there is also, so these are great questions. Um, so I just wanted to introduce the simplest one. There are also ways of overexpressing a gene. Um, so you make its expression, you know, more than what it was here, or you dampen it. So there are ways of doing that as well. Um, it can also randomize things as well. So there, are, so there are multiple ways of doing it. And, and you know, I'm here only introducing this very simple interventions, but um, you may, in that case, where I'm not setting it to a constant, then, you know, then maybe, yeah, then there are different ways of thinking of these interventions. And even, so what this one here is known as a, as a hard intervention, actually. There are also things known as soft interventions. So that would be like an overexpression. I'm not going in and actually, you know, completely blocking this graphical structure that I had here, but I'm going in and just, you know, say, you know, the graph structure is still there, but I'm now just going to overexpress it by whatever it was before, like, you know, a little bit more than what it was before. So then it, wh why is this different? Well, because what you see here in this hard intervention, if I set X2 to a constant, X1 has no effect on me anymore, right? I was just set to a constant, so I could actually remove this edge. But if I do this overexpression, well, X1 still has an effect on me, right? Whatever I was expressed before now will be expressed more. So it really depends what X1 did on me, 
Um, so that's the difference between hard and soft intervention. Today, I'll just do the simple one of, of hard intervention. But I want to, you to understand that, you know, there is a big question of which, what types of interventions are you doing in the system? And then one has to model them in the right way. Great. Okay, but I'll just be talking about these kinds of interventions. And now, um, just to show you that these are actually kind of interesting um, new operations um, that, you know, are not the same as marginalization or conditioning. And let me just remove this so that we don't have too much of a mess. Um, so let's look at the following. So now I'm going to intervene in the first example down there. I'm intervening on X4, right? Sorry that this is, okay. Well, it's just okay. Okay. Um, so here you see, I want to look at what happens when you intervene on X4. And I'm looking at X3. So I'll be looking at these two variables, x3 and x4. OK, so what happens when you intervene on x4? What happens to x3? Well, I'm intervening on something that is downstream from x3. So nothing will happen to x3, right? So this distribution will just be the same as the marginal distribution. But obviously, in general, the marginal distribution is not the same as the conditional distribution, right? If I condition on x4, that actually tells me something about x3. Right, because they are strongly correlated. So X4 will tell me something about X3. Now let's do, do the opposite. Now let me intervene on X3. Okay. Well, now X4 is certainly changing if I'm intervening on X3, right? Because X3 is upstream. So certainly it's not equal to the marginal, which is what we had before. But in this case, in fact, it is equal to the conditional. Okay. So it is really an interesting operation that you know can sometimes be equal to the marginal, can sometimes be equal to the conditional, can sometimes be equal to some combination of these things. Okay, so there's a new type of operation on distributions. It's not just, you know, if I write something like this, I, I couldn't just write conditioning. Okay, you cannot just leave out this do thing. Um, because it's interesting, right? It, it only has an effect downstream of you, it doesn't have an effect upstream of you, whereas conditioning does have an effect upstream of you. Okay, so uh, that's uh, interventions. And so now, of course, you know, there is more and more of this data. So then the question is, can you use these kinds of interventions to learn something about the graph? Well, you should be able to, right? Because, you know, if I intervene, if I have data without the intervention and data with the intervention where I'm intervening on, say, x3, well, then I just look at where does the distribution change? And if the distribution changes for a particular node, I know that it has to be downstream of me. Right? So it certainly should have give you additional information when you're trying to learn the graph. And so that's, I think, quite exciting that this is kind of new data that, you know, is coming in and, and where one needs to somehow be thinking about how to actually use this kind of data. Okay, so this is kind of the problem that I talked about. So these would be our variables, these 20,000 genes, we have 100,000 samples. And as I said, you know, these samples might not all be observational, but then you also have some samples where you know that do x1 was set to zero or do you know, x whatever three and x5 was set to zero, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So you can also have combinatorial interventions, in fact. And you know, these interventions are now available, not just in biology, but if you think of advertisement, online education, right? More and more, you can actually intervene on the system and see what comes out. Um, when you actually intervene on the system. So it's quite mm -hmm. important to try to understand what to do with this data. Yes, question. Could I ask you a question about the previous slide? Yes. Um, it looked like uh, X4 was influenced by uh, X1, but only through X2. So if we had intervened on X1, I would expect there to be some effect on X4 but when I look at the functional equation for X4, I don't see X1 appearing in it at all. What's going on there? Oh yeah, good question. But then it does appear here, right? So if you change X1, then X2 changes, and then X2 enters in here, and hence X4 changes. I see, okay, great. Right, does that make sense? But as you're saying, it only, it only comes in through X2, but since you change X1, X2 will change. Makes sense. Buck rate questions, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, 
So now the question is, how do we actually learn, right? How do we learn the underlying graph? And let's maybe first just do the simpler setting where we don't have any interventions. I just wanted to bring this up that this is kind of the newer data will have interventions and it does help. But let's maybe first look at what would you do when you actually just have observational data. So I just have data, you know, from this model. And I would like to learn this graph. Now, we kind of discussed it also in the first lecture that, you know, one way, right, I want to somehow say, so I don't know anything about the graph, right? I want to learn separation statements in the graph, right? That will tell me which edges I can remove. Well, the separation statements correspond to conditional independence relations, maybe that means that I should learn conditional independence relations. Okay, and so we already discussed this, right? So for example, the conditional independence relations that hold in a directed acyclic graph, or, you know, a node is always independent of its non-descendants without the parents. I already did that last time. Without the parents, given the parents. Okay, so, um, uh, so, so these are the kinds of conditional independence relations. We saw this as the local mark of property. It implies, you know, conditional independence relations in the global mark of property. And we would like to use these in order to actually infer the graph. Okay, so I kind of mentioned this last time uh, in the first lecture that, you know, the, the unfortunate thing is that um, for DAG, for these directed acyclic graphs, there can actually be two different DAGs that have exactly the same conditional independence relations. And so those we call Markov equivalence classes. Okay, so these are Markov equivalence classes. So these would be two DAGs, or let's actually look at this one here, just because here there are too many. These three here will be three DAGs that all have exactly the same conditional independence relation. So we cannot tell them apart. And so here, and we kind of went through this example already, here the conditional independence relation would be X is independent of Y given Z. Right? If you condition on this fellow here, then you cannot pass through anymore. Um, so, so all of these, right? I cannot tell them apart just from conditional independence relations. So just from observational data, this is all you can learn. And in fact, there's a very nice kind of graph theoretical um, way of describing what a Markov equivalence class is. Namely, two DAGs, or they are equivalent if and only if they have the same skeleton. So you see here, right? They have the same underlying undirected graph and they have the same immoralities. So, okay, so now th this will be easy to remember that these things are called immoralities. So this kind of structure is called an immorality when you have two edges pointing in and you'll see all kinds of words in, in causality that are, you know, come from philosophers because it's so close to philosophy. Uh, so we'll see faithfulness uh, appearing afterwards. Immorality here because you have two parents that have a common child, but they're not married. Okay, they don't have an edge between them. So, okay, so you'll have to bear with these kinds of words. Um, so that's, um, so that's this kind of structure is called an immorality. And so as you see, right, so for example, this graph here, x, y pointing to z, is not Markov equivalent with these fellows over here. Well, because it does have the same skeleton, but it has an immorality. And so we saw that here, the conditional independence relation is X is independent of Y and not X independent of Y given Z. Okay, so Markov equivalence classes, this is all you can identify just from observational data because the conditional independence relations are the same for all of these DAGs in an equivalence class. Okay, so causal structure learning without interventional data is just a problem of learning an equivalence class of DAGs. You cannot do better than this. Okay. So without any additional assumptions or interventional data. So if I have interventional data, these two fellows, I can, for example, tell apart, right? Because here, say you have interventional data where you intervene on node X. Well, then Y changes in this first graph. But here, if you intervene on node X, Y doesn't change. So if I would have interventional data, then I could actually tell these two fellows apart from each other. So interventional data will really help to make the equivalence classes smaller. And in fact, one has, and I think I have it here. So this has been defined. What are the interventional mark of equivalence classes? Okay. And you know, there is also again a graphical criterion, etc. Um, and so I will talk mainly about just learning mark of equivalence classes. 
But again, and I won't go into this too much, but I'm just telling you that once you know what you can identify, then the next question is, well, I need to come up with algorithms to identify whatever I can, right? So what I'm going to talk about next is actually to come up with algorithms to learn the Markov equivalence classes, not the interventional. I'll talk about that briefly. And then finally, and this is where there are still a lot of open problems, is experimental design. It's like, you know, you can intervene on 20,000 nodes and combinations of nodes. The question is, which one should you do in order to make, for example, your equivalence class as small as possible, um, in order to push a system towards a particular state, which interventions will tell you the most about the underlying graph, etc. So here there is still a lot, a lot of questions in this experimental design. And there are chat questions. Can you draw an immorality on a model with four or five nodes? Yes, I can. Okay, so an immorality is just this structure, okay, where there is no, no, no edge between these. So, you know, I can make many immoralities. Um, for example, this would have three immoralities, namely one here, and then one here, and then one here. Does this make sense? Alexander, I think, has asked. Um, so the three nodes in an immorality, do they have to be right next to each other or can they be separated farther away along a longer path? No, it has to be like this. They have to be come together. It's, it's always something that happens on three nodes. So it's really think of immorality is just the parents, they have a child and they're not married. Okay, good. I'm glad I asked them. Thank you. Yeah, so it cannot be. So this here would still have an immorality, but the immorality is just here. It's not between these nodes. Perfect question. Okay, good. So now we get to algorithms. Okay, so now we know what we can identify. This is all. Um, that's We cannot hope to do more than this. And so now we want to have algorithms to actually learn um, from data um, these equivalence classes. Okay, so let me tell you, it's actually quite clean um, that there are really only two types of algorithms for doing this. And, um, and they're kind of, you know, I told you about these two ways of doing things, right? One is like optimizing a score and the other is just doing these hypothesis tests to find, you know, missing edges. And that's exactly the two ways that we have here. Okay, so constraint based is, I just start off with a complete graph and now I, I check for constraints in the distribution. Constraints are just conditional independence relations. So I do conditional independence tests. And whenever you find a conditional independence relation, you remove the edge because it means there is a separation, right? So if two things are you know, independent given something else, it means that they cannot be connected with each other. So you just continue removing edges. And then you use some kinds of rules like, you know, um, like here, like these things where you know, I can add in immoralities because if, um, if I have, you know, if I would only know that these two guys are, I don't know the direction yet, well, I can figure out the direction, right? I know that here there is an immorality because this conditional independence relation looks very different to this. Right? So you check whether the path opens up or closes when you condition on a node in between two nodes, and that will tell you whether you have an immorality or not. Um, so that's that's the way of learning Markov equivalence classes with a constraint-based approach. Okay, so it's based on conditional independence testing, just removing edges whenever you find a conditional independence relation. The most prominent algorithm there is known as a PC algorithm. Okay, I'll talk about advantages and disadvantages afterwards. The other approach is one where um, you don't do something local where you just continue on removing edges, but you try to directly do something on the space of all graphs. Um, and so you have some score function, like what we saw last time, like a penalized likelihood score function. So that would be, for example, this BIC here. Um, and now what, I do, what you want to do is to try to just maximize this function over the space of all graphs, over the space of all DAGs, see? Or even better, right? You do, the space of all DAGs might be bigger than the space of Markov equivalence classes, as you see here, right? Because we can anyways only identify the Markov equivalence class. So let's maybe try to do a search over the space of all Markov equivalence class. 
And that's exactly what this greedy equivalent search, known as GS, what this algorithm does. It's quite complicated, right? Because you have to, I mean, the space of equivalence classes is not so easy, right? And you need to somehow move between equivalence classes and not move between DAGs. But they figured it out. It's a really nice paper, this one here. Okay, now, um, so these are two different approaches, right? One just conditional independence testing, one the other one is optimizing some function over the space of equivalence classes or over the space of DAGs. Now these spaces are huge, so these are usually greedy approaches. So I greedily optimize. Um, so for example, here, let's do it over space of DAGs. I greedily add edges and then I remove edges. Then maybe I have to add edges again, but they actually prove that you can just do this forward search and backward search in greedy fashion and you're actually going to land in the correct graph, which is really quite amazing. And again, there are questions. Are there different topologies that guide movement through the space of Markov equivalence classes? Yes, so there is a natural way to move between equivalence classes and how they do it is they show that just by somehow adding, so you start in the empty graph, you just add, add, add an edge. Um, that, that by adding edges, you know that you're moving between equivalence classes because within an equivalence class, you need to have the same skeleton. So you just have to add edges until you cannot improve the score. Then they show that, and they have a certain amount, a certain set of um, allowed edges that you can add. And then you only remove edges uh, until you cannot improve the score. And wherever you end up, they have proved that this is the correct equivalence class. It's really a remarkable statement. Um, and I'll definitely get back to this as well. Okay, so what are the advantages and disadvantages? And I'll talk about this a little bit on the next slide. Um, so usually, and this is, you know, anyone who has applied these algorithms, these score-based approaches do much better for the same sample size. Um, so they have higher accuracy. They are theoretically consistent, these ones also. Okay, so if you have enough samples, they will be consistent. Um, but, you know, this one is usually much better. It means, um, how are these doing badly? Well, and you'll get some intuition afterwards. They actually tend to miss a lot of edges. Um, and if you miss an edge, then you might also get the directions wrong, right? So, um, so they learn somehow too many conditional independence relations. And I'll, I'll, I mean, in some sense, right, in this algorithm, whenever you make a mistake by removing an edge, you cannot make it good again, right? Because it's not something that you're optimizing some global score and it's a greedy approach. In a greedy approach, even if I make a little bit of a mistake, hopefully the global optimum is still there and it's still reachable. So it doesn't matter as much. Um, so that's really the intuition. Here you're just accumulating mistakes in this constraint-based approaches. And, um, but you know, the score-based approach is a really complicated search space and we're going to talk about this one on the next slide. Okay, so these are a bit of the, uh, the advantages and disadvantages. So how complicated is the search space? And here come also a lot of open problems if people are interested in combinatorics. Um, so this is an old paper, but nobody has solved this. Um, so, and it's really an interesting question, I think. So here, N in this case is the number of uh, nodes, okay? So what they did is they, and this is completely computational, this paper, they just really enumerated all DAGs on 10 nodes. And they saw, they looked at how many equivalence classes are there on 10 nodes, on, well, on three nodes, four nodes, five nodes, et cetera, up to 10 nodes. Okay, so it's kind of, I mean, you would think that it should be possible to get a formula, right? There is a graphical, <laughs> I mean, there is a theorem which tells you, you know, graphically what it means for DAGs to be equivalent. So there is a formula for how many DAGs there are on P nodes, right? So um, it would be nice to have a formula for how many equivalence classes there are on N nodes. Um, so there is no such thing. It's still an open problem. So this was done completely just by really brute force enumerating them. So there are about 10 to the 19 many um, equivalence classes on 10 nodes. Um, what you see here, and this is super important, both of these actually for experimental design, um, is the number of equivalence classes divided by the number of DAGs. Okay, so um, these numbers, they seem to converge to something like a quarter. Again, this is a conjecture. Um, no such thing has been proven, but this is super important for algorithms, okay? So um, if this is true, that this here, this, um, this series here converges to something like a quarter, that would mean that an average, every equivalence class consists of four DAGs. So that would mean that it probably doesn't make much sense to have a complicated algorithm that moves between equivalence classes rather than a simple algorithm that just moves between DAGs, right? 
And between DAGs, it's kind of easy to move around because that's just a move between, well, by just flipping, uh, flipping edges or actually um, adding edges. Um, so this also means that in terms of interventions that you need in order to identify the graph, well, if an average, you just have to, you know, observational data already gives you everything up to four graphs, um, then you need very few interventions in order to actually identify the graph. Um, so nothing like this has been shown, although there is this nice graphical criterion, but probably just because graph theorists have not looked at it because this comes really from um, probability theory or statistics. This last column is also really interesting. Again, it seems to converge. Um, so this is the number of equivalence classes of size one divided by the total number of equivalence classes. Um, so this is also quite remarkable, right? So if this is true and it converges to something like a quarter, well, then that means that in a quarter of the cases, in fact, you know, the data, the observational data already identifies the graph itself, the DAG itself, right? Because in that Markov equivalence class, there is only one member. So in some sense, if this is, you know, holds also for larger graphs, in some sense, you should see it as this is the picture, right? So there are very few large equivalence classes. There are about a quarter of all equivalence classes look like this. They just have one member in them. And then, you know, all the other equivalence classes are kind of small. In average, they have four members. Okay, so that's um, the picture that this thing suggests. But it's really important to understand for causality, right, from experimental design perspective and also from the algorithmic perspective. Okay, but this tells you somehow how hard the problem is when you want to do these algorithms that walk around on these spaces, or really large spaces. Uh, Caroline, it, it would be interesting to know um, how large an equivalence class can get. Could we get arbitrarily large, for instance? Um, that that would then mean that you'd need to do many interventions, at least in that special situation. Perfect question. So that is actually known. So the complete graph is always equivalent to all other complete graphs because it doesn't have any immoralities because an immorality would require the edges not to be connected. Uh, so it's always uh, p factorial. Yeah, so in this one class, you'll have to do a huge amount of interventions. But you know, in general, um, real graphs or real networks are known to be kind of sparse. So, so this suggests that there are very few of these very large classes. Most of them are small. And then on average, you know, I would have to do few interventions. So hopefully, but it would be, yeah, so, but you're getting the right question. So what would be really great to know is the distribution. So that would be perfect if one could say something about the distribution of these equivalence class sites. Yeah, that would be somehow the best result possible or the best result for, you know, from all perspectives. Yeah. Okay, so this tells you something about the difficulty of these score-based approaches. Um, now about the difficulty of these constraint-based approaches, I mean, in a sense, you know, I already told you the motivation is why they actually often do poorly is, right, because every, every mistake you do, it just accumulates. And in particular, you know, these conditional independence relations, they have to be learned from data, right? So it is possible that I learn, and maybe we don't really have to go through this example, but it's possible that I learn a conditional independence, you know, if I just infer you know, there is an edge between xi and xj in the true graph, but, you know, my data is just, I just infer that xi and xj are independent given whatever x1 and x2 say. Right? Then that means that I'm just going to remove the edge, and so I'll never be able to put it back in, so I'll just make a mistake. And, you know, in order for mistakes not to happen, for any conditioning set size, right, whenever there is an edge, for any conditioning set, I need to be bound as away from this conditional independence relation. And so that's, you know, data has, you know, is random, right? So, so it is possible that just by chance, you'll actually end up kind of close to one of them, and then you're going to remove that, um, remove that edge. And I'll show you how these things look like, just because these are nice algebraic varieties in the Gaussian setting. So these kinds of conditional independence relations correspond to um, minors in the matrix, right? Um, that, that have to vanish. And so here is what I, I wrote it down in the, in the three node case. Um, so say I have a Gaussian distribution on this DAG here. Okay, I just write it out, right? X1 has no parents, so it is just Gaussian noise. X2 has only one parent, 
with this edge weight, the causal effect times x1 plus Gaussian noise. x3 has both parents, so you have here a13, a23 times x2 plus Gaussian noise. You just write out what the distribution is in terms of the Gaussian, what the covariance matrix is. And you can do this yourself, but you know, I'll you can believe me that any one of any conditional independence relation always corresponds to an almost principal minor. Okay, so it's almost principal, meaning you know it's principal, but it will be off by one. So here, for example, you know, three is principal, but then on the rows I take row one, and then on the columns I take row uh, column two. So it's always off by one. Um, and these, what it's off by is, you know, whatever these nodes are that are. This also holds for very large um, graphs, not just for the three by three case. So it's conditional independence relations always correspond to these almost principal minors. And so, you know, being close. So the problem is here. I would like to learn this graph meaning I'm not allowed to be close to any conditional independence relation, right? Because if I'm close to one of them, I'm going to remove the edge. Okay, so now you can kind of, so these are, of course, now I'm in three-dimensional space. These are my parameters. So these are my hypersurfaces. And so I can actually draw them, right? And so this is how the space looks like. So this means that my distribution has to be bounded away from all of these hypersurfaces in order for me to learn the correct graph. Because if I get too close, right? So in statistics, right? You know, because you have, you know, you have to do so conditional independence tests. You're going to test for the covariance, the partial correlation being zero. Well, you'll depending on your sample size, you'll have to say like, hey, you know, if I'm smaller or equal to some constant, I just have to assume it is zero because I'm never going to observe a zero, right? You always have to introduce some cutoff where you're saying, if I'm getting close uh, under this cutoff. I'm going to conclude that I actually have a conditional independence relation. So really you should see this as fattened up hypersurfaces. And so your distribution for you to actually be able to learn the correct graph has to be bounded away from all of these. And we did this kind of like, you know, figuring out what the volume is, et cetera. But you can show that, you know, it's so improbable that you'll not make a mistake, right? Basically you'll always make mistakes. And that's why these algorithms actually don't perform so well. And there is a question. Is the natural measure of closeness here the Euclidean distance from these sub varieties? And uh, no, and this is actually a super important question. And um, we did this work. Actually, it's really interesting. And so some people of you guys who are interested in, in uh, varieties, so you can have, um, so it's actually really quite nice. So you can have singularities in these varieties. Okay, and if you, so you want to look at which points are smaller or equal to lambda of this, you know, as close to these varieties. Actually, let me take a very simple. Um, if this is my, you know, x times y equal to zero is my, um, is uh, my, my hypersurface. And now you're looking at all points such that x times y is smaller or equal to lambda. Well, how does that look like? It looks like this, right? So you see that the singularity is fattened up much more. And um, so really these volumes are given as long as the sample size grows fast, the volumes are actually just defined by how bad the singularities are. Um, so this, and in fact, they're defined by this, you know, what is known as the log canonical threshold um, of these singularities. In this case, these are real varieties. So the real log canonical threshold. Um, so this is really interesting. It's um, yeah, it's actually these singularities that matter. And those are the ones that get fattened up the most. Is there a, a suggestion yeah, so there a to read more about this? Uh, yeah, we have a paper. Um, uh, uh, Lynn, so I guess Lynn Stormfels Bühlmann. Oh, I guess it's a math paper. So our name, these are the authors. Actually, nearly the same as up here. So it's and yeah, it's called something on real log canonical thresholds and causality. And there are a lot of open questions. Um, we only know this because we cannot really. I mean, Xiaowei Lin is amazing at actually computing these real log canonical thresholds, but even with him, we're able to do it. You know, only for some graphs and very special ones. It would be really great to have like better bounds, etc. Here. Yeah. Okay. So that tells you a little bit about the problem. Um, so now, okay, perfect in time. So um, good, so these are the two approaches. Okay, so I think now it should be clear that why do constraint-based approaches usually do worse? Just because they accumulate these 
um, these errors and errors occur just because you know you are kind of at some point you, you will be testing something where you have to be close to one of these hypersurfaces that you want to be bounded away there's just not much space left right um, so score based approaches would be really, really cool to have, but it's a bit of a complicated space. So the question is, can we somehow run a score based approach over a smaller space um, so that we maybe do even better than these kind of score based approaches that have been defined here that go over graph space over all over Markov equivalence class space. So that's what I want to do. So um, and here is the proposal. And so now we're going more into combinatorics and geometry in this setting. Okay, so um, we already talked about learning undirected graphs and somehow that problem is actually not so hard. I mean, you know, it's, uh, well, you also need assumptions, etc. but you know, that's solved quite well. So why is the problem of learning a directed graph so hard as compared to learning an undirected graph? Well, it's actually just because, you know, what makes it hard is that you have to learn the ordering. So I want to learn a DAG, so that means we need to learn a permutation. Okay, so not just the skeleton, we also need to learn the permutation. Now, if I would actually give you the permutation, then it's known that learning the skeleton, so where the edges are, is actually equally hard as just the standard problem of learning an undirected graph. And let's just put that under the rug for now and know that there are good algorithms for doing that. Okay, so then the question is really how do I learn the right permutation? Well, so then I mean, the idea is very simple, right? So instead of doing a search over Markov equivalence classes, since I already know how to learn undirected graphs, let me just concentrate on doing a search over permutations. So um, that space is smaller. Well, maybe, right? So on 10 nodes, at least, it looks much smaller than this 10 to the 18 or 10 to the 19 that you saw on this slide. Um, now, of course, we don't have the number. I don't know how this grows, right? Uh, it's unknown. But you know, hope it is conceivable that it grows much, much faster than the space of permutations, although the space of permutations is also huge. Okay, so that would be one motivation. Hopefully, you know, the space of permutations is actually much smaller than the space of equivalence classes of graphs. But of Sorry, course, that's just a conjecture. Mm -hmm. Caroline, could you write down a, a permutation of five um, uh, nodes and, and tell us um, uh, what graphic corresponds? Oh yeah, okay, yeah, let me do that. So um, let me do four. So I'll do four and usually I do the ordering, um, which is topological so that I always have the edges pointing from the smaller nodes to the larger nodes. So you can always write down the complete graph and just make it topologically ordered. Um, so you tell me now that these variables that this is how they're ordered. And now, how do you go from here to, to learning the skeleton? So what you do is um, you, just, you just do the following conditional independence test. Actually, I have it written out afterwards. So I don't know why I'm doing this. But you just test whether two nodes are independent given everyone before in the ordering. Right? This is kind of the motivation of what we had before. It's like this um, local Markov property where we have xi is, indep or is independent of its non descendants given its parents. So instead of, since in this permutation, the parents are just everyone before, you just do this conditional independence test where you do xi kind of xj given everyone before in the ordering. So if i is smaller than j, then it's one up to j minus one without i. Okay, and if you have a conditional independence, then you just remove that edge. So if, for example, here, one would be independent of three, given two, and say one is independent of four given two and three, then that means that I would remove this edge and I would remove this edge. And this would be the graph corresponding to this particular ordering when I'm giving you the conditional independence relations that hold. So, I mean, there is of course a proof to do, et cetera, but you know, this, yeah, I mean, I guess you can show it from um, the local Markov property um, or global Markov property that if I give you the correct ordering, then this is, in fact, the graph that you get out that satisfies most of the conditional independence relations or is the same thing is also it's the sparsest graph um, consistent with this ordering that satisfies the conditional independence relations. It's a result and maybe I have it. 
Um, this is good. No. Yeah. It's a result by Perl. And here it's actually written out nicely. So for every permutation pi, what you do is you can construct a DAG, which is consistent with that ordering, where all you do is you define when there is an edge. And there is an edge if and only if these two nodes are dependent given every one before. And Perl has defined this way of doing it. This is known as a minimal IMAP. So this is not something that we've done. Okay, but for now, let's just say like, you know, this is well understood. So I can go from a permutation, I can output the corresponding um, directed graph that is consistent with this permutation and satisfies as many of the conditional independence relations as, as possible. And in fact, the only ones you have to test are these ones here. You just have to test for every edge, you only have to test one conditional independence relation. Okay, so that's the mapping. Okay, so if I give you the correct, the, an ordering, I, you can output a corresponding DAG. And in the process you just did, should you always delete edges in order as well? No, it doesn't matter on the order. Um, you know, I can, it's just here is this statement has, I mean, it doesn't matter if I start uh, with which edge you're starting to test. But maybe I didn't understand the question. Oh, no, I did. Okay, perfect. Okay, so that's this mapping. So the question is, how do we learn the correct graph? Um, so now, okay, so there is another statement, and that's a theorem we proved at some point, that in fact, and actually it's not a, it's a very easy claim. So in fact, the sparsest graph is the correct one. Okay, so if over all permutations, I do this mapping, I go to these DAGs, and I just choose the sparsest one of them, then this is in fact going to be the correct graph. So the question is, how do I find the sparsest one, right? I don't want to search over all, per I don't want to enumerate all permutations and be like, which one is the sparsest one? Um, so the question is then, what do you do? Okay, so we have seen greedy, right? So the only thing we can do is do something greedy. So let's do the following. So I want to get to the sparsest one. So my score function is now a super simple one. It's just the number of edges in these DAGs G pi. And over all permutations pi, I want to find the corresponding graph that is the sparsest. Okay, so how do we do this? So, okay, so obviously we have to do something like greedy search. So how would you define greedy search over permutation space? Well, good, so the space of permutations is a permutahedron, right? It's a, it's a convex polytope. Um, you see here, every vertex is a permutation. And you know many of you will be very familiar with this with this body. Um, so neighboring permutations they correspond to neighboring trans, uh, transpositions, right? So here, for example, three one four two. Uh, which one are the ones I'm looking at? Three one four two, and three four one two. Here we go. You see that these two guys. All you do is you you um, transpose the middle two guys, and you see here every node has degree three because on you know permutations of length four, there are always three possible per, uh, three possible transitions, neighboring transitions. Okay. So here I can do, I can tra transpose the first two guys, then I get to three, one, four, two. I can transpose um, the next two guys, I get to one, four, three, two, or I can transpose the last two guys and I get to one, three, two, four. Okay. So this is a very nice object. Now, of course, okay, so now I'll just start somewhere randomly. And what I would really like to prove is, you know, and I get a corresponding graph, right? And I get a score function, which is how many edges there are in there. The question is, if I just move around on this thing greedily, will I ever get stuck? And so what we proved, um, I mean, actually, so in this paper here, I'll show you what we did in this paper, but here that we will actually never get stuck. Um, so I don't even have the right reference. It has been published. Um, that will actually not get stuck and that you will actually end up in the correct graph. So that's quite interesting. So it says that every local optimum is a global optimum, right? So if you move around and I have to define like, well, it's actually well defined, but like, you know, the problem is that the local optimum can be broad. Okay, so every local optimum can kind of be broad because there can be many elements here that have the same sparsity. And you have to allow this, okay? So I have to walk around on things that have the same sparsity. But that means that if I do that, then you know there is a path to get to the global optimum. And that one, again, might have right multiple uh, graphs that have the same sparsity. Um, but that one will, in fact, be the correct one. 
in particular, since uh, someone asked about the full graph, right? It's Markov equivalent to all. So all permutations are Markov equivalent. Um, so learning a causality is NP hard. And this should come out here, right? I cannot get around NP hardness. So for me to figure out that the true graph is the complete graph, I need to visit every permutation, right? Because I need to know that the full permutahedron corresponds to the same sparsity. Namely, it's the complete graph. Oh, when can I tell that I actually have nothing sparser than this? So when the true graph is the complete graph, I need to move everywhere around. I cannot get around this NP hardness result. OK. Um, so and there is something else that is maybe nice if you're coming from more from a geometric perspective. And so that's another thing that I want to say. So let me actually go to the next slide. OK. So if you, and maybe this is too complex. Well, actually this is okay of a graph. So if I look at this graph here, so here there are certain orderings that are consistent with this graph or a certain permutation, right? One is smaller than two is smaller than three is smaller than four, but also two is smaller than one is smaller than three is smaller than four. Okay, so for both these permutations, you will get the same graph out. So in some sense, I already know if I'm in the, First, in this permutation here, I already know that I shouldn't be checking the next permutation because I know it's going to give me the same graph up. So I could actually make the search space smaller by contracting permutations that correspond to exactly the same DAG. Okay, so you know we start off with this permutahedron, but there will be permutations in here that correspond to exactly the same DAG. So it doesn't make sense for me to actually search over this big search space. Maybe I can search over a smaller search space. And that's what this DAG associahedron is that we defined here since Fatima is also talking here in the paper with Fatima. This DAG associahedron. Um, where, you know, in this case, so here you see, for example, these two permutations that give rise to exactly the same DAG, we collapse them. Okay, and now this is something that is quite surprising and we proved in this paper is that, in fact, you know, in general, you cannot take a, 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 a polytope, right, and just collapse edges and hope that you get another polytope out. But what we prove here is that this actually holds here. So if you just collapse, right, vertices that correspond to the same graph, you actually get another polytope out. Um, and that's this, what we call the stag associahedron. And in fact, when we do our search, really, we're actually walking around on the DAG associahedron and not on the whole permutahedron. So this is a slightly smaller search space, and this is in fact where we're walking around. Okay, so this result that you actually that it is um, consistent, so that you don't get stuck anywhere, is you know yes, it's true also for this larger polytope, but in particular, it's also true for the smaller polytope. Okay. And just to show you that these things, you know, they do work, they're actually quite fast. So we, we're not the people who make algorithms very fast. We can prove that they work, but um, it's quite, I mean, we're very happy. This is not from us. So here, this is Frederick Eberhardt. He does um, um, experiments on brain data where he wants to know about neurons. You know, these are huge data sets where you actually have 100,000 neurons. And so you really need these algorithms to work fast. So our Python implementation, I mean, there are all these other causal implementations that are faster like this PC algorithm that I already showed you, and then this GS algorithm, et cetera. But I think it's already quite nice that you can actually, I mean, in, in this implementation that we have, it already runs faster than the standard way of learning an undirected graph. Um, so they do scale, you know, to thousands of variables. Um, and, you know, they do better than PC or GS as you, oh, I didn't, here is a different one. But yeah, I mean, we have like, um, different kinds of, you know, where you actually show, uh, as you could see already from the theory, you can prove that you will be consistent under strictly weaker assumptions than needed for PC or GES. Okay, so the oldest math is actually helpful. And maybe I get just because I'm basically done, I should say something more about open problems. So we do have, so the interesting thing is that with a search over permutations, you actually also get consistent algorithms where you have interventions. Um, so the only previous algorithm that was able to deal with interventions, we proved that it is in fact and usually get stuck. So if you do the thing of searching over graphs, you will get stuck. Um, so you cannot have these graph, you know, this GES interventional version. Um, you cannot run that with inter uh, this GES with interventional data because it's, yeah, I mean, to explain it, it's like, 
it makes sense because like the interventional graph, as we saw, right, when I do an intervention on a particular node, right, if I intervene here, it's like I can actually remove this edge. And so in some sense, you have done data, which is a mixture of different graphs. And so I can just mix them in some way to make sure that you'll actually get stuck and you will not output the correct graph. But if you search over permutations, whether you do an intervention or not, you're still consistent with the same permutation. Um, and so that's in fact what you can use. Um, you can just do these, these same permutation algorithms here. You can just do them also with interventional data. Um, but where we are stuck, and here we have like big open problems. Um, so we only did this for directed acyclic graphs. Um, but you know, this means that every variable is observed. But of course, in many applications, we do have latent variables, so variables that are not observed. Now, when you have a latent variable, say this node here is not observed but I do observe these two guys, that in fact, the graph that corresponds to it has bi-directed edges. Okay, so in fact, what you would like to be able to learn is graphs that have directed edges and bi-directed edges. Now, this particular graphs that we care about in these applications, they are consistent with a process. So instead of a search over permutations, we need to do a search over process. Now, the amazing thing is, again, that the space of posets is, again, a poset. So you're doing a search over the space of posets, so over the poset of posets. Again, we're searching for the sparsest one. We do have the result that the sparsest one is the one that we care about. But we do not have the result that we don't get stuck anywhere. Okay, so you're doing a search over the space of posets. And since Daniel is there with you, um, you can ask him about it. Um, so, you know, so um, we do know that we want to get to the sparsest poset. We do have a way that we think we should be walking around on the space of posets. And we have run this for thousands of graphs and we never got stuck. Um, so the conjecture is that you will not get stuck, that every local optimum is a global optimum when you're doing the search over the space of posets. Um, and it would just be really nice to actually show something like this or to do something similar as what we did here, right? We got to this DAG associahedron by somehow combining some of these um, permutations that correspond to the same graph. Well, what is the smaller space that you want to search over um, so that we can actually learn these causal graphs with latent variables? And then if you want even more challenge, well, um, these are just some latent variables. If I have latent variables downstream of me, I don't only have bi-directed edges, now I also have directed edges. So I have these graphs that I want to learn that have directed, bi-directed, and undirected edges. And so I have no idea what the right representation is of these. It's not a post set, it's not a permutation. Um, it would be very interesting to know how we should represent these and what is the space that we should actually be running around on. Um, okay, one more minute. I think I will not do this, but um, what would be really interesting to know is like which one is the algorithm that has the weakest assumptions required. So if I give you infinite computation time, what is the algorithm for learning a causal graph that has the weakest assumptions required? We think it is the one where you just search actually over all, you don't do a greedy search over permutations, you just search, you know, put out all permutations and just choose the sparsest one. Um, but we don't have a proof that that one is actually consistent under the weakest possible assumptions to actually learn the causal graph. Okay, and with that, um, all these open problems, uh, there is a lot to do here. Um, and it is really nice geometry, it's really nice combinatorics. Um, and also algebra, in fact, if you, if you want to do it in the Gaussian setting, right, you have these hypersurfaces um, that you need to be testing. And so I have the references are kind of ordered, you know, there are the standard textbooks here or a very good, nice book for reading in the evening. If you want to learn about causality, it's a super nice book by Pearl. Um, then there is, uh, these are like kind of the more basic references. Then comes the things on Markov equivalence classes. As I said there, there are a lot of open problems on like how large are these equivalence classes? What is the distribution of them? Um, then comes these faithfulness questions. Um, then come uh, the score-based approaches, and then comes everything with, with interventions. So I try to order them so that if you care about reading up on some of these things, you have some reference. Great. With that, I'll take some questions. Thank you, Caroline. So it was a wonderful sequence of lectures, so thank you very much. Um, I know there was lots of questions during, but there is time if anyone wants to ask any further questions.
you have Daniel there, so you can. You yes, can I think him. Daniel's here in the room as well. <laughs> but he'll be there for the program. There he is. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Thanks, Will. So I, I have a question about um, for the for the undirected edges case, actually. Um, uh -huh. So the, the ancestral graph condition, right? Like you can't have any arrowheads leading into an undirected edge. So I mean, that would just be could could you just maybe do this with like a pre-order where um, all of your minimal elements are equivalent or something or like or a pre-order where ah, this is probably too complicated to be useful but um, yeah like a pre-order yeah, I don't know like, how to do it okay yeah yeah but it should be something like that but um, yeah. I don't know what the right representation is. It has to be a right representation so that you can then show that the sparsest one is the right one, right? Yeah, um, I guess. So, so, yeah, so, so, yeah, but I also have not thought about it. I think we had like a hard time enough with this one. So, <laughs> 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 but I think this will be the next step, right? If we cannot prove this, then it, then if one can come up with something reasonable that also has undirected edges, it will be quite nice. And it should be something nice mathematically. Yep. Well, you have a nice, lot of uh, very smart people around you there. So maybe after this semester, you guys will have it all worked out. <laughs> Could you say a little bit maybe about the connections to rigidity here? Uh, so to rigidity. So I mean, from these things, we have worked on other things that are connected to rigidity. And Daniel has worked on even other things that are connected to rigidity. So I don't know the connections of this thing to rigidity. Um, how gene regulation is connected to rigid. I mean, from this, we want to get to gene regulatory networks, right? So how that is connected to rigidity is, um, I mean, I'll just do a very different. It's actually, so, you know, we look at gene regulation as something like a directed graph. But in fact, so the genes that are co-regulated there, I, I had the picture actually in the last lecture, I had the picture in, that they're actually close to each other, right, in space. And so now there is all this data. So you would, so actually you should, in order to learn these graphs, you should also use the data which tells you which genes are close together. And, and so there is this data which tells you, and maybe you guys would actually have fun in terms of all of the people who are interested in rigidity theory. Um, so there is this data that tells you which genes are close in space together. Okay, so it's a contact frequency, actually. It tells you for the whole genome, like, you know, this is how often and how many cells these two genes were, were found close enough in space. So usually then what people do is they take the contact distance matrix, they do one divided by it to some whatever, whatever one half or power or something. And so that will be changed, turned into a distance matrix. Okay, so now we have a distance matrix in here. And so we want to reproduce the packing, but it's actually a different, it's actually not your standard um, problem, Euclidean you know, embedding problem, because humans have two copies of every chromosome and they are basically the same. So in fact, I don't get the distance. So you know, if I have this particular point I and this particular point J, I don't really get to see this distance, but I have an I prime and I have a J prime. And so ij is actually the sum of this plus this plus this plus this. So it's actually the sum of four things that you get to observe and not you know, the distance between the two. And so the question is, if I give you that kind of measurement, and we just had a paper with Kaya Kubias on this, and we have, again, a lot of open problems in there as well. It's, it's on the archive. If I give you this kind of distances, well, how do these graphs look like? How are the embeddings, right? And how many more, so we already know there are infinite many embeddings, actually, if I just give you, so even though the number of constraints is actually large enough that you would think you should be able to embed it into 3D, um, it's actually not, it doesn't identify the, 
the embedding. So there are infinitely many ways of embedding it. So the question is, what other constraints do I need so that I can say something about rigidity, um, so that I can really identify the embedding? So this is Kaye. So it's Believa, Believa, Kubius, and it's a very recent. Maybe it has been put on the archive maybe a month ago or so. So that's the only connection. <laughs> it's a very different kind of connection, but that's how I connect it to rigidity. But maybe Daniel wants to say something about it. Maybe as he sees other connections. Well, I have a question about this. Okay, okay. I, I there are other connections, but wait before that, a question about that. So this like ambiguity you say, this unidentifiability, is this up to some? Okay, so so like in the in the classical distance geometry problem, right? You still have ambiguity, but it's like you know Euclidean yeah. isometry. Is there? Like yeah, no, no. It's more than that. Yeah, there... so it's actually up to a sphere. Yeah, so we do know it. So it's up to a sphere. So so these i and j's, they will you can identify the center of them, and you can identify that they have to be somewhere on the sphere. Okay. Okay. And I guess there's there is I mean is there some kind of like algebraic group or whatever that you can like write down that like that that, that like describes the fibers here like the way like the Euclidean group does in the distance geometry case. Well, I mean, it would be the sphere, right? So, I don't okay, know what. I guess, okay, I guess I'll, I guess that's probably in the paper, so I'll, I'll just have to. Yeah, so that. it's up to the sphere. It's actually, yeah, it's a really nice result. And then we try to figure out what are constraints that are reasonable, you know, from um, that we also have in biology that where we could actually then identify more and more, et cetera. So we have it in there. But we have, you know, there are like results where you would want to have unique identifiability, we just have you know, identifiable up to whatever, at least discrete many points and not, you know, infinitely many points, et cetera. So it would be really nice if you guys look at it, if you care about um, a problem and rigidity theory. Yeah, yeah, I've been, uh, I, I, saw, I saw Kaya talk about that like a while ago and I've been excited to, to see the paper for a while. So this will be cool to think about. Yep, but, that was um, my problem. I was sitting on it for too long, <laughs> but it's <laughs> out. It's, it's always advisor's problems, these things, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, other connections, I guess, like um, more on the graph, on the undirected graphical model side, like especially with matrix completion things, because I guess if, if you're as old, Carol, that you can certify existence of the MLE by like bounding the, uh, you, 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 yeah, you can certify existence of the MLE in a graphical model if you know the minimum matrix completion matroid that the corresponding graph is independent in. Um, yeah, I left out all of that. I had three lectures. If, it, if I had four lectures, that would have been what I talked about, the existence of the MLE. Yeah, but you're there, so you can hold a lecture on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I'm sorry, I missed your I missed your lecture yesterday because I had a job interview, but... Uh, oh, I hope it went well. Yeah, so. yeah but you should give it. I didn't talk about it, so, so yeah, you should give it. Maybe tomorrow, since you guys are looking for uh, something to, to fill. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, Daniel, if you want to. Yeah, I mean, if people are interested, I'd be happy to. Um, it's a cool connection. Um, yeah. Um, I guess we're out of questions. So, so thank you again, Caroline, for the great lectures. And um, the next talk is in the last talk of the winter school is in twenty minutes. So I'll see you all again shortly. <laughs>